When the first Honda Civic Si came to America, it was a lightweight, affordable, practical, reliable sports car. Of course, it was also 1985, so it had 91 horsepower under the hood, and it was born in a world of international hot hatches that were mostly forbidden fruit in America. In 1985, the sports car your parents drove was probably a Mustang, but the shopper interested in the Civic Si was quite different. That begs the question, is the new Si still the lightweight, approachable, fun to drive car that I remember, or is this rather like me versus 1985 me? A little bit older, a little bit fatter, perhaps occasionally dreaming of the past. In order to answer that question, we need to go back in time and remember what 1985 was like. In 1985, the Chevy Cavalier was the best-selling car in the United States. In fact, it was the best-selling anything in the United States at that time, and half of the new cars sold in America were manufactured by General Motors. Cars outsold trucks and SUVs by two to one, and a shocking number of vehicles were sold as two doors and hatchbacks. 85 was also an exciting year for Honda. That was the first time they had ever sold more than 100,000 cars in the United States. That was about half of what AMC sold in 1985. Of course, today things are a little bit different because now the plucky upstart manufacturer is a member of the establishment quite firmly. And last year, Honda sold more vehicles in the United States than Chevy did. Back in the 1980s, the original Civic Si had an MSRP of $7,999. That may sound really cheap in the 21st century, but that was $1,200 more than the average new car price in America at the time. That's a pretty significant bump over a Chevy Cavalier, for instance. Now in 2022, this model starts at $27,300, well below the average new car price in America. Even though when you take a look at that 1985 price and you adjust for inflation, this is more expensive than that model. Talking about the automotive landscape is important because this is considerably less expensive than the average new car in America, even adjusting for the recent rapid increase in prices in 2020, 2021, and 2022. So clearly Honda is still focused on affordability with the new Civic Si. Let's see how the rest compares. Whether we're talking about the regular Civic or the Civic Si, this generation definitely has a more grown-up feel than the previous generation. We have a pretty slim grille right there, a little bit more cooling going on below. The grille does change if you get the Si versus the regular model. And then we have multi-module reflector LED headlights on each side with an accent strip. They're joined together right there across the front with that small, slim black grille section. Kind of reminds me of perhaps a, a bandit with an eye covering there. And then above it, we have this body-colored section that separates the grille area from the hood. Back in 1985, I was about three feet shorter than I am today. And back in 1985, the Civic Si was about three feet shorter than it is today as well. This is 184 inches long, and you'll notice it's available only as a four-door sedan. The original Civic Si was kind of a funky three-door hatchback thing, and the Civic Si has been a coupe, it's been a four-door sedan, and it's been a hatchback in the United States. But for this generation, no Civic Si hatchback. I do think that's an odd twist since we do have a new Civic hatch in America and no two-door coupe. Why no two-door? That's pretty easy to explain when you think about it. Back in 1985, a whopping 4.3 million two-door vehicles were sold in the United States. That was nearly 43% of the entire car market in America. Just 10 years later, that had dropped down to 1.8 million. In 2015, it was down to 2.6% of the American car market, just 400,000 units. And the entire car market in the United States had grown by 70% versus 1985. So we're talking about really dwindling numbers. And in 2022, less than 1% of expected new cars in America are going to be two doors. So there's simply not a business case for a sportier styled version of the Civic Si. Nobody would buy it. As you'd expect, we get upgraded brakes in the front, but these are an in-house design by Honda, meaning that cost is definitely going to be lower as far as replacement calipers, rotors, pads, etc. than a Brembo brake design that you might find in some of the competition. We get a unique 18-inch wheel here, and it's wrapped in 235 with summer tire. On this particular model, summer tires are optional. If you'd rather have all seasons, you can do that on your SI as well. This particular one is a Goodyear F1. Completing the grown-up transformation is the rear-end styling. We have partial LED tail lamp modules. Everything back here is pretty common with the regular Civic. We have incandescent turn signals and incandescent backup lights. A fairly subtle spoiler, although it is black to contrast with the body, but if you get a black Civic Si, obviously it's not going to contrast a lot. And then down at the bottom of the bumper, we have twin exhaust tips, but nothing funky, nothing oval, nothing trapezoidal. Uh, there aren't three exhaust tips or four exhaust tips, just subtle two, one on each side. 
As we see in most new Hondas, there's a ton of driver assistance tech on the SI, and it's all standard. Autonomous emergency braking, adaptive cruise control, blind spot warning, and lane keeping assistance are all standard on every model. Under the hood, we find a lightly tweaked version of the 1.5-liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine from the previous generation Civic SI, although oddly enough, it produces a little less power under this hood. 200 horsepower, 192 pound-feet of torque. As always, it's mated only to a manual transmission. It's a six-speed unit, and you'll get 31 miles per gallon combined. Versus the original Civic SI, this is about twice the power, but 50% more curb weight. I honestly appreciate that Honda still has a manual transmission SI, and I appreciate that they have not put a continuously variable transmission on the Civic SI, but I would love to see them incorporate a dual clutch transmission, because part of the mission of the SI has always been to be pragmatic and attainable simultaneously. And modern dual clutch transmissions are quite pragmatic, because a lot of people daily drive Civic SIs and daily drive the competition, which is why most of the competition sales, whether we're talking about the sporty versions of the Forte, the Elan or a Volkswagen Golf or a Volkswagen Jetta, they have dual clutch transmissions. And that generally yields you better performance, better fuel economy, and more daily driver livability. Not quite as much engagement as a six-speed manual, of course, but definitely a lot of practicality. Jumping into the front seats, the first thing I noticed is that the front doors open nice and wide, making getting in and out very easy. We have a six-way manual driver seat design. The seat bottom cushion does not adjust for tilt, but it does adjust for height. We also have a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty large range of motion. One interesting omission, the front seats are no longer heated, but they are still really bolstered, and the bolstering is fairly narrow. So if you're much larger than I am, you might have troubles with these seats, but they fit me just about perfectly. The seat bottom cushion bolstering and the seat back cushion bolstering both are fairly aggressive. One thing to note, no adjustable lumbar support. Jumping into the back, we find nearly 80 inches of combined legroom. Keep in mind that this Civic is 10 inches longer than a 1980s Honda Accord, and as a result, there's pretty generous legroom. I uh, can definitely sit back here very comfortably with the front seat adjusted. For me, at six feet tall, I have about five inches of legroom left. Even if I scoot over to the right side, where this front seat is all the way back in its tracks, I have about half an inch of legroom left. Now, headroom, that is a little bit more limited back here. If I try and put my head back there towards the headrest, I do have to crane my head to one side. That's simply because of the swoopier roof line that we find in this generation of the Civic versus Civics of the past. As far as headroom back here goes, 37.1 inches is pretty mid-pack. You will find some slightly roomier options, but you'll also find a few that are a little bit more constricted. Likely to keep costs and weight down, we don't find any air vents for the rear seat passengers, but we do find a full down center armrest with two cup holders and 60-40 folding rear seats. But you should keep in mind that that latch mechanism does poke out of that rear seat back, so that may limit cargo practicality depending on exactly what you're trying to push through from the cargo area right here into the passenger area. Behind the trunk lid, we find 14.8 cubic feet of cargo capacity. That's relatively large for a compact sedan in America. You will find just a hair more in the Forte at 15.3 cubic feet, but this is decently above the Corolla at 13.1. Unfortunately, 22-inch roller bags will not fit in this position and allow the trunk lid to close, but some smaller roller luggage would likely be able to stack right here across the back. Again, we have those 60-40 folding rear seats, and the releases for them are right back here in the trunk. Under the load floor, we don't have a spare tire from the factory. We just have a can of fix-a-flat and a little bit of additional storage space. But I wouldn't be surprised if a spare tire would fit under there if you could find one that would clear the brakes. As we look around the interior, keep in mind the SI comes in only one configuration. We have a moonroof right there. It is powered. It's a pretty typical size, just over the driver and front passenger's heads. We have sun visors that slide to the side, height adjustable shoulder belts, and fixed in place headrests. On the seat back, there's the embroidered SI logo. You can see that the center fabric is sort of a maroon and black checker affair. And then we have black fabric on the outside. Definitely unique seat design right there with pretty aggressive bolstering for the seat back and seat bottom cushion. That same fabric continues over there to the driver and front passenger doors where we also have that red accent stitching. The front and rear doors are a little bit different. You can see that the rear door does not have that same fabric insert, and that trim panel just above it is a little bit different. Over here in the front seat area, it's a glossy black plastic, and most of the plastics on the door are hard. The upper section of the door, the midsection of the door there, that's all hard, as are the plastics down there around the bottle holder at the bottom. The only soft touch materials really are just the armrest and that fabric insert. The dashboard design is logically shared with the rest of the Civic lineup. Panning across, you can see that we have this very long horizontal grate running across the dash. That's definitely the defining feature of this interior. Red accent for the Civic SI trim. We have soft touch materials above and then harder plastics below. We do find a pretty decently sized bin style glove compartment there. I was just barely able to fit a 10 inch tablet computer inside. Now this grate section, it 
encompasses the air vents and sort of dead space here, I guess you could say. So if you zoom in really close, you'll see that we just have some hashed lines to give that extra depth, but no air vent in the middle. We do have an air vent over there on the passenger side with its control, little knob right there below, and then air vents right here in the middle without a controller knob. They have a really nice click to them, so you can move them side to side, up and down, and you get a little click back action there, but uh, that other side there that's not a diffuse air grate. Right here in the center of everything, we have a touchscreen infotainment system. It supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, as you can see. It also supports wireless CarPlay. This is one of the later software interfaces from Honda, so it's pretty similar to what we find in the Accord and some of their other newer vehicles. There are a few physical buttons over here on this side, home, back, volume knob, and then a tiny little track forward backward toggle. Under that, we have the engine start stop button, the controls for the single zone automatic climate control system, so no dual zone here, and again, no heated seats for the front. Two USB inputs, I guess I should actually say one USB input, one USB charge only port, and then a 12 volt port there. We have a storage area right here, no wireless charge mat in there, and it's just a little bit too small for some of the larger smartphones like that one. Over here we have the drive mode toggle. This allows us to choose between sport, normal, and individual. Six speed manual transmission shifter reverses over to the right and down exactly where I think it should be. Button to disable the auto start stop system there, electric parking brake, auto brake hold, and then two decently sized cup holders. The center console is no longer a sliding bin. Instead, we have an armrest that opens with this sort of U-shape that's always there. We then have a fairly small storage cubby right behind. In case you're wondering, the key fob is fairly simple. There are just four buttons right there on the front. Moving back over to the dashboard, on the driver's side, we have a partial LCD instrument cluster. So the information over here on the left side, this dial, the digital speedometer there, and the normal section there, that is all part of an approximately seven inch LCD. This is not a full LCD cluster as I sort of had expected to see in the Civic Si. So we still have a physical speedometer over there on the right side. In addition to typical displays like driver attention, there are also a few SI specific gauges like throttle and brake. There's also a G meter available right there, a stopwatch, and of course the other usual things. But aside from that, the theme of the cluster doesn't really change too much. So if I toggle back to sport mode, you can see that things don't really change that much there or in individual mode either. The basic steering wheel design is similar to the rest of the Civic lineup, so no flat bottom or anything like that. It is a round wheel. We have a small sport grip up there, contrasting stitching there, and it's a four spoke design with two slim bottom spokes and slim side spokes as well. Over here, you'll find the controls for the infotainment system as well as this roller knob and home button that controls that multifunction LCD cluster. And then over on this side, we find the controls for the standard radar adaptive cruise control system as well as the aggressive lane centering system. Out on the road, you're probably not going to notice the loss of power versus the previous generation SI. This still has a great feel to it. And 0 to 60 is pretty reasonable at 6.7 to 6.9 seconds, depending on the run. Remember, this is a manual transmission, so your 0 to 60 time will depend on how good you are at a clutch, how willing you are to roast that clutch, of course. Now, keep in mind that most of the dual clutch competition, it's going to be faster every time 0 to 60 versus the average driver in the Civic SI because it can simply shift faster than you can on this six-speed manual. Of course, to many people, the entire point of the SI is the manual transmission, and Honda has a really fun one here. I love the engagement. I love the shifter feel. I also love the clutch pedal. I honestly think this transmission, the shifter, the pedal, etc., it's just better put together than what we find in Volkswagen's offerings at the moment. And that's definitely high praise because the GTI also has a great feel. It's just the notchiness of the shifter. It's really easy to tell exactly what gear you're going into. The car, of course, does the automatic rev matching for you if you want that option. And the ratios are really well spread out for this 1.5 liter turbo. Obviously, this is going to have a very different feel from previous generation SIs that used a naturally aspirated engine, but I like the fact that we get this extra low end torque. So for daily driver livability, if you're just hanging out here in fifth gear, you can romp on the throttle and you'll get acceleration where you wouldn't have in the previous generation SI. You'd have to do a lot more downshifting in that model. So I think it's a pretty decent idea for the SI, but some folks are obviously still going to be sad that we don't have that high revving four cylinder anymore. As you'd expect out of a relatively lightweight sedan with 235 with summer tires on it, handling is absolutely excellent and I give this an A+. I really love the fact that Honda's giving us a summer tire package from the factory so you can immediately experience all that the Civic Si can do for you when it comes to handling. Also, the steering is excellent here. This is definitely an improvement over the previous generation Si and the previous Si was no slouch either. This has a really great suspension tune and a lot more feedback from the front tires than we find in something like the Elantra N-Line, 
and the uh, Forte GT line. Now, if you get an Elantra N, that takes things to the next level. We get more power, we get more of everything in that model, but it's not the direct competitor to this. It's not somewhere between this and likely the upcoming Civic Type R. As far as Mazda competition goes, honestly, the Mazda 3 is not the same thing as an SI. It's targeting more luxury than handling ability. The rear suspension is not fully independent. Uh, it just doesn't behave or feel like the SI out on the road. Even if you're on a winding mountain road that is poorly paved, this suspension tune absolutely grips the road like there's no tomorrow. And I think the front tire feel is just a little bit better here as well. The Mazda 3, it really becomes upset over broken pavement quite easily. A more interesting comparison in many ways would be to something like a BMW 2 Series or a Mercedes-Benz CLA. And in that comparison, this Honda Civic Si can really hold its own in terms of grip, handling feel, steering feedback, steering feel, etc. All of that really is right up there with the next level in terms of pricing for a front-wheel drive sporty car. And of course, keep in mind that those options are not going to give you a six-speed manual transmission. A major difference between this and the previous generation SI that I did not expect is that we no longer get the adaptive damper setup that we found in the previous model. Honda says that it was because not too many people were using the sport mode in that model, they found it too harsh, but I suspect that also cost is a reason that they deleted it in order to help keep the sticker price low. Probably also the same reason that the heated seats are gone here. Uh, I don't imagine that too many people just failed to press the heated seat button, it probably had a cost basis. Now for this suspension tune, Honda decided to split realities. and. To tune this somewhere between sport and normal mode in the previous generation SI. I think that was the right choice to go as far as tuning a single mode suspension like this, but I really, really liked the adaptive suspension system that we had in the old SI. It did give you the option of firmer damping for sportier driving and softer damping for your daily commute, because again, the SI is all about being daily driver livable, and I think that would have been a great thing to continue to put on this. It would also have helped differentiate this a bit more from the regular Honda Civic. Now, out here on this rough gravel road, I'm going to give the ride quality a B minus because you'll certainly find things that are more compliant. And you will notice you will definitely feel all the little potholes that I'm going over here. But this is not firm and bouncy like you could sometimes get in the previous SI when it was in the sport mode. Likely due to the summer tires in this model, I measured 72 and a half decibels at 50 miles an hour, definitely making this one of the louder compact sedans. Now back on the subject of ride quality out here on this paved road surface, the kind of road surface a lot of people are going to be driving on, you will definitely notice the firmer suspension tune versus the outgoing Civic Si. So I think this has lost a little bit of daily driver livability because it's lost that dual mode suspension. And again, that's something that I really wish Honda would bring back. Now, rather unfortunately, I have not been able to test the SI with the all-season tires. It's possible that the ride quality could be a little bit better on that model because the sidewalls are going to be structured a little bit differently than the Eagle F1 tires that are on this model. An area where the SI has always done well is fuel economy, and that continues for 2022. I've averaged just over 32 mpg over a week of mixed driving. That's definitely above average for the compact sedan segment, whether we're talking about performance options or normal options. If you want something with better fuel economy than this, especially on the interstate highway, you're going to need to look at something like a hybrid. Of course, if you're doing a lot of city driving, then fuel economy is going to be lower. A lot of slow and go, again, it's going to be lower as well. But this does have the auto start stop system on it, so that'll help you save a little bit of fuel. According to a lot of studies, it's around 5 to 7% for in-city driving. Now let's talk about how I really feel about the SI. To be honest, I'm a little bit conflicted. This is an absolute blast to drive. If you have a winding mountain road like this near you, this is an incredible amount of fun. But I have to say, the regular Civic is an incredible amount of fun as well. And maybe this is not really a ding on the SI, but commentary about how good the regular Civic is. You see, the Civic Si has more power, it has more braking ability, it has summer tires, etc. But you could put summer tires on a regular turbocharged Civic and you could get a lot of the way to this handling ability with the softer ride that you get in the regular Civic. In my mind, it's sort of like this. If the Type R is 10 out of 10 and a regular Civic is so good that it's 8 out of 10, you would expect in many ways that the mid-level performance option would be 9 out of 10, but in reality I think this is more like 8.2 out of 10. It does take things to the next level, sort of, maybe a semi-step above the regular Civic. Obviously we have the turbocharged engine, the manual transmission, a little bit more power, a little bit more braking ability, some unique styling bits here and there, but it's not worlds apart from the regular Civic. The regular Civic is just awfully fun on its own. 
Now, admittedly, most of the Civics you'll find on dealer lots will have a CVT, and that's not going to be as fun as the six-speed manual, but you can get the manual transmission in other Civics, and it's going to be very, very similar to the six-speed that we find in this vehicle. The result is that when I drive this and a regular Civic back to back, I'm not sure whether I should feel perhaps a little bit disappointed in the SI or just incredibly impressed with the regular Civic. But either way, these are two absolutely excellent compact sedans. If I think really long and hard about it, the problem probably is me. It's probably a rose-colored view of what the SI was. I started this episode with a history lesson as much for you as for myself, because I might want the SI to be more, but when you really look back into it, the SI has always been regular Civic with the knob turned up just a little bit. It's never been that next level of performance. Improved handling, improved acceleration, improved braking ability, yes, all of that, but it's never been worlds apart from the regular Civic. And in that respect, this SI continues that tradition. The important thing, of course, is that with that in mind, there are a few vehicles that will give you that next level of performance with price tags that are not too far off this SI. Price-wise, this generation of the SI sticks very close to the outgoing model at $27,300 starting, or $27,500 if you choose the summer tire option package. And honestly, if you're buying the SI, I would recommend getting the summer tires. $200 is a really cheap summer tire upgrade. Now, obviously, it's going to cost you a bit more because your next tire swap is going to be a lot sooner than if you didn't choose the summer tires, but I think it's worth it for the added handling ability. Now let's dive right into the competition. There are a ton of great options that you could logically cross shop against the Civic SI, but keep in mind, this is an SI, not the upcoming Honda Civic Type R. So there are also a decent number of performance options that are gonna be the next level in performance, but they're not direct competitors to the SI. So on the Hyundai side, the first one here is the Elantra N-Line. With a 1.6 liter turbocharged engine under the hood and a six speed manual standard, power levels are right in line with the Civic SI. As far as performance figures go, they're quite close if you get the manual transmission because it really is gonna depend on how good you are at shifting either of these manuals. I do think that the transmission, the shifter, and the clutch pedal engagement is better on the Honda Civic than it is on the Elantra N, but of course, Hyundai has a trick up their sleeves with the dual clutch transmission offering. The DCT is pretty much always going to be faster zero to 60 than the manual transmission, whether we're talking about the Elantra N line with the manual or the Civic SI with its manual because the robot can simply shift gears faster than you can. Of course, keep in mind that the DCT in the Elantra N line is not as smooth as a traditional automatic. So in a lot of stop and go or slow and go situations, it can be a little rough around the edges compared to a traditional automatic, but it is going to be a lot more engaging than the continuously variable transmissions we find in so many other options out there. Now, if you want a little bit more power in your Elantra, there is the full-on Elantra N that produces 276 horsepower, putting it somewhere between the Civic Si and the expected upcoming Honda Civic Type R, but a little bit closer logically to the Type R in terms of its general performance profile. Also in terms of the changes that we find in that model versus the regular versions of the Elantra. It receives unique interior components, different seats, different front end treatment, etc. It also has an available dual clutch transmission, but it's not the same one that we find in the Elantra N line. The full on N products in Hyundai's lineup get the newer eight speed dual clutch transmission. It is a lot smoother than the seven speed. And that one I think is an appropriate competitor to a lot of automatic transmissions out there. But the Elantra N is going to cost you more. It starts at $31,900. That's a reasonable amount of a bump over the Civic Si when we're talking about vehicles that are well under the average new car price in America right now. Now, if you are willing to look at a vehicle that's around $30,000 or a little bit over, we have two options from Volkswagen. We have the Volkswagen GTI hatch, that's $29,880, or the Jetta GLI sedan, the more appropriate competitor to the Civic Si, really, for $31,295. Both of these models offer more power and more performance than we find in the Civic Si, but you're going to pay more for that extra performance. The GTI has a 241 horsepower engine that is definitely a decent amount of fun. Again, we have dual clutch transmissions offered in both of these vehicles, so if you don't want to shift your own, then these are going to be a great option. Now, the Germans generally have really good manual transmissions, especially Volkswagen, because they sell a ton of manuals all across the world. But I have to say, I prefer the way the Civic Si's manual transmission feels, just the shifter engagement, the notchiness of it, uh, the throw link, etc. and the appropriate distance between the pedals, especially the way the clutch pedal feels and the way it's located, I just prefer the one the Civic Si. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with the ones in the Volkswagen, it just didn't quite fit me when I drove it last. 
At the moment, things are named a little bit oddly within the Hyundai Kia conglomerate. So on the Hyundai side of things, N line in the Elantra means an engine upgrade. Full on N means another engine upgrade. But over on the Kia side of things, GT line is just an appearance package. GT gets you the 1.6 liter turbo, and there is no Forte with the two liter turbo. If you can get over the confusion, the Forte GT is definitely a great deal. It starts at $23,490, and the dual clutch transmission is standard. It's $24,490 if you want the manual transmission. If you want the dual clutch transmission, then you're probably going to want some of the option packages that you can get on that model. And that's one of the big reasons that you might want to look at the Forte GT over some of the other options because it has a really low sticker price, a really long standard warranty, and you can get it with features like heated front seats, ventilated front seats, a power sunroof, etc., and a power driver's seat. Features that are not available on the vast majority of the competition here when we're talking about under $30,000 vehicles. Even with all of those options added on to the Kia, it's still going to be notably less expensive than the Civic Si. And with the extra cash that you're saving, you could buy an extra set of wheels, more tires. You could buy a bunch of different accessories if you wanted to. You could try and chip your engine if you wanted to get a little bit more power out of that 1.6 liter turbo. Now. The DCT is still the 7-speed DCT like we find in the Elantra N-Line. It is not the newer 8-speed dual clutch that we find from Hyundai and from Kia. That one is a lot smoother, as I said before. Just keep that in mind. But I have to admit that if I were shopping in this segment, I would be pretty torn between the Forte GT and the Civic Si. I really love the manual transmission in the Civic Si. It's really great. But I have to admit that at this point, with my daily commute, etc., I would probably lean towards the dual clutch transmission, even though it's not going to be quite as smooth as a traditional automatic. It is just a little bit easier to live with. It is perfectly acceptable as far as sporty driving goes. Again, not as engaging as a manual, but DCTs get relatively close. I also really appreciate the long standard warranty that we find in that Forte GT. It's definitely longer than we find in the Civic Si. And then, of course, there's the feature content that we find in the Forte GT. So if you're interested in an infotainment system that's a little bit easier to use, a little bit snappier in terms of responsiveness, you're going to find that in the Forte. You're also going to find the ventilated seats, the heated seats, all that sort of stuff is going to be found in that model. Also, the power driver's seat. Let me know what you would pick down there in the comment section, and let me know if you're just a tiny bit disappointed that the Civic Si isn't sort of a midway stop on the journey between a regular Civic and the Civic Type R. I would argue that in the Volkswagen lineup, we do see that with their Golf. We have the Golf, then we have the GTI, and then we have the Golf R, and they're a little bit more spread apart in terms of their performance ability, handling dynamics, etc. The GTI is definitely a decent upgrade over the regular Golf, but then the Type R, or the Golf R, I should say, is that next step yet again. And I suppose you could say that the same thing is true of the Hyundai and Kia options here because they go from a naturally aspirated engine up to the 1.6 liter turbo. And then if we're talking about the Hyundai, you go from there up to a 2 liter turbo with 276 horsepower. So again, there's a bit more daylight on either side of their midline performance option. Let me know what you think about that down there. Find me over at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those other social places. I'll see all of you next week.